This budget hearing conducted by the Committee on Appropriation Adjudication will now be convened with the Guam Police Department. I want to thank the Vice Speaker for joining me this morning. Chief, thank you very much for bringing your team with you this, this morning to present the testimony of the uh, Guam Police Department. You may proceed. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Uh, before I begin with my testimony, I'd first like to introduce uh, the team that's with me at the table. To my right is the Acting Police Commander and Operations Bureau Chief, Major Manny Chong. To my, I'm sorry, that was to my left. Uh, to my, further to the left is uh, Captain Sonny Castro, the Invest Investigations Bureau Chief. To my immediate right is my Acting Administrative Services Officer, uh, Ms. Anne-Marie Cruz. And to my far right is the Services Bureau Chief, Major Andrew Kitagua. Manana Sidouas and Hafade, good morning, Mr. Chairman, and the members of the Committee on Appropriations Adjudication. Madam Vice Speaker, good morning. I am Joseph Cruz, the Chief of Police for the Guam Police Department, and I'm here in my official capacity, along with key members of the Guam Police Department, to render testimony on the fiscal year 2019 Guam Police Department budget review process. What you see on the screen is the agenda for this morning's testimony. As my staff officers and I begin our testimony, I would like to first thank the committee for your support of the Guam Police Department, and I look forward to a continuous collaboration between GPD and this legislative body to ensure that the police service is at a level expected by the people of Guam while operating as efficient, efficiently as possible to ensure that we achieve the best return on our investments for every single dollar spent in our budget. It is important to note that the staff and management of the Guam Police Department continues to work closely with the Bureau of Budget and Management Research, BBMR, and the Department of Administration to ensure that we are meeting the intent of the current Budget Act in accordance with the Governor's Fiscal Realignment Plan, identified in Section 20 of Public Law 34-87. The Guam Police Department has reduced its FY 2018 budget by $631,746 and continues to closely monitor expenditures on a daily basis to ensure that our personnel of police officers, statisticians, criminalists, law enforcement dispatchers, mechanics and administrative and logistics non-uniform employees are led, paid, trained and equipped to perform their duties. I am confident that the FY 2019 budget request submission achieves this and is adequate. With regards to GPD's mission, the Guam Police Department's core mission is the enforcement of criminal laws. Each police officer in GPD is authorized to, one, protect life and property, two, enforce law, three, prevent crime, four, preserve peace, five, arrest violators pursuant to Title VIII of the Guam Code Annotated, Six, serve the public. Seven, conduct searches and seizures of property pursuant to Title VIII of the Guam Code Annotated. And eight, perform duties as a peace officer. GPD is authorized to cooperate with any federal, state, national, or international law enforcement agency, including any law enforcement entity of any possession of the United States where a reciprocal agreement exists in detecting crime, apprehending criminal offenders, and preserving law and order. GPD shall have jurisdiction within Guam over all lands, whether titled to the government or not, including submerged lands, all waterways, whether navigable or not, and over airspace above such land and waterways with respect to which Guam has jurisdiction. Since mid-2016, GPD's mission is executed through a community ordered policing strategy, or COPS. COPS is applied through a two-year strategic plan that is managed by quarterly task implementation meetings to measure the performance of all GPD management staff. Strategic goals are, one, engaging our community through, through the delivery of a superior level of police service with transparency, community outreach, accountability, and compliance with the highest professional standards. Two, achieve organizational excellence and provide superior service. Three, increase community and business par partnerships to enhance the capabilities of the department and foster positive relationships. 
four standardized processes and policies to synchronize the performance and uniformity of the force to ensure equal application to the public, five, to enhance agency interaction and outreach, and six, enhance operations and increase uniform and civilian capacity and training capabilities. With regards to GPD's vision, the Guam Police Department has stated that it, it will continue to grow, adapt, and evolve as we provide the highest level of service and protection to the residents and visitors of our island community. With this vision in mind, we will achieve it by providing our officers and employees with the knowledge, tools, and opportunities to meet and exceed all present and future needs of the island within the scope of law enforcement services. We will work in cooperation with our community to proactively identify and address areas of needed improvement and continually provide the level of service and safety deserved by our entire community. With regards to our metrics on community-ordered policing, the success of this concept of policing overall is currently undergoing a business process review in conjunction with the University of the South Pacific. The COPS business process review will, one, create a model for assessing stakeholder perceptions about community-ordered policing, two, present a context for comparative analysis of stakeholder positions, and three, propose a direction for improved community policing based on stakeholder positions. The COPS assessment is expected to be published in early 2019, and it will shape our vision to grow, adapt, and evolve as we provide the highest level of service and protection to the residents and visitors of our island community. With regards to our organizational structure, the Guam Police Department is interdependent on eight divisions that are structured into the Office of the Chief of Police and three bureaus, the Services Bureau, Operations Bureau, and the Investigations Bureau. Positions funded in each division will be illustrated in both option one and two and will comprise GPD's entire staffing pattern. A presentation of needed funding for operations will follow, also illustrated by option one and two. Starting with the Office of the Chief of Police, the Office of the Chief of Police is responsible for the achievement of departmental goals and objectives, the preservation of the peace, protection of life and property, and enforcement of all laws. The Chief of Police is assisted by staff personnel that include, at his discretion, a staff assistant to the Chief of Police or a SACOP, a liaison to the Department of Homeland Security, and an administrative services officer. The Chief of Police has direct line authority over the Auxiliary Service Division, the Police Commander, and the Services Bureau's Administration and Support Divisions. The Office of the Chief of Police and the Auxiliary Services Division's strategic direction is to improve the accountability and transparency of the Guam Police Department and GPD's conversion to the Community Audit Policing Strategy. 20 positions are funded in the Office of the Chief of Police and the Auxiliary, Auxiliary Services Division for a total personnel cost of $1,933,424. There are zero vacant positions in these divisions. In the Auxiliary Service Division, one funded position is occupied by an employee on long-term military leave, and one fun position is funded, is occupied by an employee on long-term medical leave. There are two positions funded in the office of the chief of, I'm sorry, there are two positions funded in the office of the police commander for a total personnel cost of $126,685. There is one vacant position for a police commander. That the need for a police commander is critical to the establishment of direct leadership over the line units in the operations and investigations bureau. The administration's Division's strategic direction is to develop employee competency and capabilities, enhance recruiting efforts, improve leadership capability, implement cost-saving programs and practices, including the management of federal grants, and providing administrative services to the general public. Including the Services Bureau Chief, 43 positions are funded in the Administration Division for a total personnel cost of $2,128,391. There are six vacant positions in this division. 
One position is for a police captain who is a division chief and is needed for the efficient leadership of the division. One position is an administrative assistant who is supervising the complex processes at the records and identification section and needed for the efficient leadership of the section. Two positions are for payroll clerks needed for the processing of payroll for a large agency. Two positions are for data control clerks, one needed to assist the processing of over 50,000 public transactions per year at the records and identification section. In the administration division, two funded positions are occupied by employees on long-term medical leave. The support division's strategic direction is to enhance mobile computing and communication systems, implement a law enforcement records management system and national incident-based reporting system, develop and sustain capital improvement projects for GPD's facilities and vehicle fleet, and provides administrative services to the general public. 30 positions are funded in the support division for a total personnel cost of $1,945,004. There is one vacant position in the division for a clerk one assigned to the information technology section needed to support automation objectives. In the support division, two funded positions are occupied by employees on long-term military leave. While in our second year of Mandania community-oriented policing, GPD's transformative growth is seen in the much closer community partnerships that we have built with the Neighborhood Watch Program, implementing 38 NWP groups in 16 villages so far. The NWP is a definitive force multiplier of public safety efforts, directing, directly contributing to the prevention of criminal acts, critical information on illicit drug distribution activity, and details that have led to the apprehension of crime suspects. The Business Watch program has had the opportunity for GPD to have the broad discussion of safety and security for hundreds of businesses across our island, from the mom and pop store, village store, to the boutique hotels in the tourist district. Officers in the field have established a robust safety network amongst businesses. The Coffee with a Cop, Cookies with a Cop, Junior Police Cadet and D.A.R.E. programs have carried our message throughout all age groups and with the complete rollout of the community-oriented policing initiatives in the upcoming fiscal year, we expect to fulfill the paradigm shift away from traditional policing. In our administration and support divisions of our Services Bureau, all efforts to achieve strategic goals is seen in the application of fiscal year fundings to all programs supporting efficiency in department operations and investigations. GPD currently manages 22 federally funded grants and subgrants that support major programs throughout the recent fiscal year. The most recent and notable grant programs are 15 police officer recruits in the amount of $1,660,578, GPD communications upgrade in the amount of $1,170,000, evidential control facility in the amount of $1,045,000, police patrol vehicles in the amount of $1,000,000, and a network system conversion in the amount of $500,000. A total of $9,477,765 in grant funding is available at this time and we continue to seek funding opportunity announcements to support our operations. GPD has currently recruited seven police officer trainees, carefully selected from a total of 23 eligible candidates and two police officer trainee interview sessions since the beginning of the fiscal year. The aforementioned police officer trainees are projected to begin certification training in mid-June and commencement to field duty in February of 2019. 18 patrol cruisers were procured with general fund and official vehicle inspection safety funding known as OVIS at a cost of $720,000 and fleet repairs to patrol vehicles are ongoing at a cost of $24,000 thus far. 
In close collaboration with the Guam Housing and Urban Renewal Authority, GURA, GPD expects that the opening of the new central precinct headquarters in the village of Sinanya will be secured by a $2,937,300 Community Development Block Grant, or CDBG. GPD also funded the procurement of needed hardware compatible with the AGES upgrade for approximately $100,000, which includes desktop computer, computers, laptop computers for mobile field work, and evidence processing scanners and related equipment. When the AGES upgrade goes live on June 19, 2018, we expect that our officers will be more informed. While performing field operations, they will be supported by essential data in real time, increasing situation awareness, officer safety, and the efficiency of our service. Under option two, there are no changes to the number of full-time equivalent positions, vacant FTEs, or funding projections in the Office of the Chief of Police, the Office of the Police Commander, the Auxiliary Services Division, the Administrations Division, and the Support Division. Under our Operations Bureau, this bureau is comprised of a Neighborhood Patrol Division, a Special Operations Division, and a Highway Patrol Division. The strategic direction of these divisions is to develop and implement community-ordered policing units, establish and maintain freely associated states or FAS community outreach, neighborhood watch program planning and implementation, business watch program planning and implementation, street level drug interdiction, adopt training programs to prepare personnel for our physical fitness qualification test, establish personnel training on how to handle people with physical and mental disabilities, establish current civilian volunteer police reserve eligibility standards, cyber security safety building, road safety, and maritime safety. Including the Operations Bureau Chief, 154 positions are funded in the Neighborhood Patrol Division in the following precinct commands. Starting with Dedito Precinct, with 40 FTEs and one vacancy at a cost of $3,214,055. With Timoning Precinct, they have 38 full-time equivalents with one vacancy at a cost of $2,911,824. Hagatnya Precinct Command with 37 FTEs and one vacancy at a cost of $2,982,969. And finally, Agat Precinct with 39 FTEs, two vacancies, at a cost of $3,165,223 for a total personnel cost in Neighborhood Patrol Division of $12,274,071. There are five vacant positions for patrolmen throughout the Neighborhood Patrol Division. The need for patrolmen is critical to the demand for law enforcement response and overall protective services for the general public. 45 positions are funded in the Special Operations Division for a total personnel cost of $3,814,213. There is one vacant position in this division. A detention facility guard needed for the efficient management of persons taken into custody on a, on a daily basis in GPD. 16 positions are funded in the Highway Patrol Division for a total, total personnel cost of $1,575,217. There are zero vacant positions in this division. In the Highway Patrol Division, one funded position is occupied by an employee on long-term medical leave. With regards to our community outreach, the individual precincts have developed and implemented community-oriented policing strategies that is practiced by all personnel, but the different efforts are tasked to the community resource units, also known as CRUs. The Neighbor Watch Program and Business Watch Programs are the two biggest efforts for all precincts, and they have established working relationships with the different neighborhood and business watch groups. The CRUs conduct community outreach presentations at schools, mayor's offices, town hall meetings, 
and neighborhood watch program meetings regarding whatever the individual groups want presented to assist them in strengthening their efforts. GPD's Safe Housing Task Force membership goals are to work with other agencies and community groups to address housing issues of the FAS citizens and engage FAS community leaders to join in our efforts at community outreach in all known problematic FAS communities. With regards to drug interdiction, the individual precincts have increased patrol level drug interdiction. There are efforts to provide training for patrol personnel by identifying new forms of illegal drugs that are coming onto our island, such as cocaine and spice. Training to identify, training on identifying characteristics of users of these illegal drugs and training on the dangers of interacting with these types of drug users. Several personnel from the Highway Patrol Division and the precincts already have attended training on advanced roadside impaired driving enforcement, also known as A-Ride, and three Highway Patrol <clears throat> Division personnel have been trained as drug recognition evaluators, or DREs, as part of the patrol level interdiction effort. As we deal with persons with disabilities, GPD has a command staff personnel attending training on how to handle people with physical and mental disabilities which were passed on to the rest of the personnel. <clears throat> there is ongoing coordination with training of, there is ongoing coordination of training with related stakeholders to educate the personnel on how to deal with persons with mental or physical disabilities who may be victims of crimes or suspects. These stakeholders are the Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center, the Division of Integrated Services for Individual with, Individuals with Disabilities, and the Attorney General's Office. Instructor certification, certification training for Operations Bureau personnel is being coordinated by the Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center in the near future. And the DISID is supporting, is sponsored training for patrol supervisors and assistant supervisors on how to deal with persons with physical and mental disabilities, which will also be scheduled in the near future. With regards to our overtime mitigation plan, due to the financial constraints placed on GPD, there will be no overtime accumulation for non-emergency functions, such as requests for police assistance for many community events. Operations Bureau had to adjust the way we provide police assistance for the different events to minimize overtime, but still provide some type of assistance. Overtime accumulation is still a reality due to the other tasks and functions of police personnel, such as providing testimony for judicial proceedings and traffic court, and the need to complete police reports when a person is arrested and then booked and confined. The Special Weapons and Tactics Certified Command Staff personnel have been assisting in the execution of search warrants by the Mendania Drug Task Force to alleviate overtime accumulation. Command staff personnel have also assisted our Marine Patrol section by meeting federally funded grant enforcement obligations. GPD management is implementing creative ways of cutting overtime costs in other ways, such as the newly implemented grand jury pool where sergeants two and lieutenants will testify before the grand jury, just as AG investigators do on non-complex cases on behalf of the officers, many of whom are off duty. When we consider the DOC augmentation, the Guam Police Department was tasked to provide operational assistance to the Department of Corrections due to the severe lack of manpower. This plan was to mitigate overtime accumulation, which affects the whole of government of Guam. The operations plan was executed on March 4th, 4th 2018, where the Aganya Precinct Command's area of, of coverage was accomplished by personnel from GPD's Special Operations Division and the outside law enforcement agencies. The agencies that assisted GPD by providing personnel are the Department of Parks and Recreation, the Department of Agriculture, the Port Authority of Guam Police, and the AB Wampat International Airport Authority Police. Personnel from CI, our Criminal Investigations Division, and our Special Operations Division 
were also tasked to provide personnel for the Haganya Precinct Command coverage. These personnel were working out of the Special Operations Division office in Tumuning and utilizing Haganya Precinct Command's assigned patrol vehicles, outside agencies' patrol vehicles, and SOD patrol vehicles. The DOC operation changed when DOC only needed 18 personnel, with the rest returning back to GPD. On March 30th, 2018, Hagatnir Precinct was reopened with the rest of its personnel returning from DOC and with the assistance of SOD and CID personnel. The outside agency's personnel returned back to the respective agencies. During this augmentation, GPD personnel assigned to DOC did not accumulate overtime and DOC realized the savings of $29,855. The amount was the difference of overtime paid on February 3rd, 2018 of $114,455 and overtime costs of $84,600 by March 31st of 2018. The DOC augmentation concluded on May 25th, 2018. Under option two, there are no changes to the number of full-time equivalent positions vacant FTEs or funding projections in the precinct commands that make up neighborhood patrol division, the special operations division, or the highway patrol division. Moving on to our investigations bureau. This bureau is comprised of the criminal investigations division and the forensic science division. The strategic direction of these divisions is to increase investigative and analytical capabilities establish and strengthen working relationships with our partners in the Pacific region, address transnational crime through criminal intelligence and investigative capabilities, improve data collection and sharing, and the accreditation for analytical laboratories. Including the Investigations Bureau Chief, 41 positions are funded in the Criminal Investigations Division for a total personnel cost of $3,553,734. There are four vacant positions for investigators with the Criminal Investigation Division. The need for investigators is critical to the demand for complex law enforcement investigations and overall protective services for the general public. 25 positions are funded in the Forensic Science Division for a total personnel cost of $2,000,000. $142,498. There is one vacant position in this division for a criminalist too. A criminalist is needed for the complex processes required in a laboratory environment. In the Criminal Investigations Division of our Investigations Bureau, the Mandania Drug Task Force continues its efforts towards the interdiction of illicit drugs and activities. Since its inception, there have been more than 180 arrests for possessions of primarily crystal methamphetamine, of which more than 1,200 grams has been confiscated with an estimated value of $600,000, along with more than 15,000 grams of marijuana valued at over $500,000 and prescription pills valued at more than $22,000. To achieve these arrests, over 90 search warrants were executed to apprehend these drug offenders through a joint effort with our SWAT and K-9 contingent. The MDTF continues to address illicit drug activities and through intelligence is currently investigating the confiscation of more than 17,000 grams of cocaine valued at close to $1 million, which has resulted in 10 individuals facing charges for possession and distribution. By far, this has been the largest cocaine seizure on our island to date. Also, 430 grams of spice or synthetic marijuana has been confiscated, consequently resulting in four individuals facing charges for possession and distribution. By far, this has been the largest seizure of that drug as well. With these arrests regarding cocaine and spice, it unfortunately suggests the infiltration of other alternative drugs into our island. 
However, the MDTF will remain diligent in combating the illicit drugs affecting our community. With the success of the MDTF, our federal counterparts have taken a more intimate role in operations, thus strengthening our efforts and working relationships. In addition, our criminal investigations section has executed nine warrants of inmates with respect to a homicide investigation at the Department of Corrections. Although this case is ongoing, we continue to collaborate with the Office of the Attorney General to ensure a successful outcome. This is inclusive of four other homicide investigations whereby persons were charged accordingly. During the latter part of last year, our holiday season, and early this year, the community came, became victim to a rash of robberies. As a result of these unfortunate occurrences, robbery task forces were established to apprehend these offenders. Through intelligence-based investigation and collaborative efforts with our patrol counterparts, more than 30 arrests were effectuated and five minors were taken into custody. Transitioning to our Forensic Science Division, the complete overhaul of our heating, ventilation, and air condition, or HVAC system, is nearing completion, which should be on or before June of 2018. The Department of Public Works continues to ensure this project meets build specifications and regulatory standards as the project progresses towards completion. With respect to the build of the Evidence Control Section facility, we are working closely with the Department of Public Works, the Department of Land Management and the Chamorro Land Trust Commission, and the Environmental Protection Agency to assure that regulatory requirements are met for the site build location. At this juncture, the Department of Interior has been apprised as to our progress and will continue to provide guidance to ensure the use of the dedicated DOI compact impact monies in the amount of $1,045,000. Under option two, there are no changes to the number of full-time equivalent positions, vacant FTEs, or funding projections in the Criminal Investigations Division and Forensic Science Division. As we look at FY19's funding for operations, the Guam Police Department's request to fund operations presents a reduction from the current fiscal year expenditures. Overtime is projected at $800,000, but supported by $150,000 in salaries and $100,000 in benefits, totaling $1,050,000. Travel is projected at $80,000, which will support executive protection operations when the governor, lieutenant governor, and first lady travel abroad. Contractual services are projected at $895,600 to support a system service maintenance agreements for our land mobile radio system supporting the whole of the government of Guam communications, the maintenance of the law enforcement records management system and forensics laboratory information systems, lease agreements for vehicles and high capacity office copiers, medical and dental care for GPD's canines, environmental control systems maintenance, pest control services, and mandated cost sharing for the criminal justice information systems to the Unified Courts of Guam. Office rental space is projected at $983,826 to support facility needs for the GPD headquarters accompanying the Office of the Chief of Police, Auxiliary Services Division, Administrations Division, Support Division, Criminal Investigations Division, Records and Identification Section accommodations through PSF monies and, evidential, and an Evidential Control Section. Supplies and materials are projected at $771,093 to support fuel from the General Fund for a larger, more efficient vehicle fleet, paper, pens, toiletries, and related administrative supplies from our Police Services Fund, and services, repairs, and replacement parts for patrol vehicle fleet from our official vehicle and inspection safety fund known as OVIS. Equipment is projected at $102,329 
to support law enforcement gear such as firearms, ammunition, duty belts, tasers and replacement cartridges, and handheld radios and needed parts and batteries. Workman's compensation is projected at $11,200 to support duty-related incidents. Miscellaneous is projected at $1,536,041 to support the uniform clothing allowance and stipends for civilian volunteer police reserves, a funding match for the COPS hiring program, and funding matching for the Recreational Boating Safety Program. Utilities are projected at $1,160,114 to support power, water and sewer, and telephone and ethernet service. FY 2019 operations under funding under option two in the general fund, the general fund appropriation is $26,000,000 $224,002, a decrease of 12.69% or $3,811,237 from the current fiscal year. This decrease allocates for GPD to sustain all current full-time equivalencies and as mentioned earlier, the, addition, the additional recruitment of police personnel funded by a federal grant, our COPS Hiring Program Award, Option two does not allocate for overtime, which decreases salaries and benefits in proportionate amounts. Severely decreased categories are utilities by 94.30%, office space rental by 78.25%, contractual services by 75.26%, supplies and materials or fuel by 66.67%, and miscellaneous by 43.98%. Unfunded categories are equipment, workman's compensation, capital outlay, and drug testing. GPD expects that option two budget will require that severely decreased and unfunded categories will need to be funded in order for police operations to continue. Even without an overtime budget or the expectation of locally funded growth, Option two imposes a shortfall of $2,182,246 from what was, we are requesting in option one. Option two continuing obligations for contractual service and office space that we currently occupy will default and GPD will not be able to sustain services at the level of efficiency we currently provide. An example would be the relocation and reduction of the records and identification section services, which averages approximately 1,000 public service transactions per week or 54,000 transactions per year. GPD's patrol vehicle fleet has grown by 18 units in the last month, and we expect 17 more units in the coming year. We expect to survey older, less efficient vehicles to ensure that we manage only with that which is needed. Funding the categories of utilities and supplies and materials or fuel will be funded in option one levels to sustain police operations consistent with what we currently provide. Option two general funds will be managed with the expectation that in order to allocate sufficient funding in the categories that provide based on 2017 expenditures, fuel in the amount of $267,940, workplace facilities in the amount of $708,605, basic utilities in the workplace in the amount of $1,080,604, agreements that provide and maintain our communications, network, and office systems in the amount of $799,901, and workman's compensation and drug testing in the amount of $13,099 for a total amount of $2,870,149. Without budgeting for overtime and the respective salaries and benefits or travel, GPD will target a reduction consistent with the shortfall between options one and two of $2,182,000 
This target reduction will directly impact the salaries category, and although GPD expects the personnel separations over the first and second quarters will provide some relief to this target reduction, it will not be enough to avoid a furlough in or around the third quarter of FY19. GPD has provided information to this committee on the impacts of a furlough and the calculations that will follow for a rollout that is timely and compliant with Appendix H of the Government of Guam personnel rules and regulations. An example of a non-continuous 32-hour workweek furlough that means at least to a $2 million target reduction will affect all personnel for 23 weeks under option two. A 23-week non-continuous furlough will reduce general fund expenditures by $2,057,562. GPD operations will continue while our employees suffer the negative financial impacts of a furlough. When considering the FY 2019 budget proposal considerations, the Guam Police Department continues to reference our Table of Organization and Equipment, or TONE. The TONE represents the distribution of sworn and civilian support personnel and equipment, and the management and as a management tool for our resources, which will be positioned to maximize the efficiency of our service. Sworn personnel recruitment supported by Public Law 33-163, enacted on June 23, 2016, allocates for 40 police officers per year from 2017 to 2021 in the TONE and presents a clear understanding for commanders and staff officers, the Guam Police Department's projection of personnel and equipment growth. The assignment of personnel and equipment to address the demand for services in specific areas is crucial, crucial to the establishment of a performance-based budget. The demand by the public in the number of calls for service per year is addressed by the supply of personnel who are properly trained and equipped. The calls for service in a calendar year and the distribution of those calls over the fourth precincts by percent, we understand the impact or the demand for officers in each precinct whose primary function is law enforcement's first response. Understanding this demand allows us to determine the number of patrol officers in each precinct, which we acknowledge as our main effort. The Guam Police Department continues to utilize a police response matrix as discussed in last year's budget hearing. The GPD, TONE, and response matrix together provide a comprehensive picture of how our resources are performing and prompts us to adjust when necessary. Option one clearly supports continued performance, while option two severely diminishes our personnel resources, which will affect non-emergency calls for service, as well as administrative services that we provide. The Guam Police Department's 2019 budget proposal transmitted to the 34th Guam Legislature is a realistic need that greatly considers the challenges that we face in fulfilling public safety goals and objectives and our fiduciary responsibility supported by the public budget. GPD has made great strides to sustain our performance this fiscal year and comply with the target reductions required in the government of Guam. In conclusion, as we move forward into our FY 2019 budget submission, the Guam Police Department is requesting a total of $35,907,707 in option one funding. This request is $697,448 or less than 1% decrease from our current FY 2018 budget. We are confident that this will sustain our current progress of improving our level of police service. The general fund, special fund, and federal fund matches portions account for the true personnel costs to include overtime projections that have decreased by $400,000 or 33% of the current fiscal year allocation. 
Additionally, Option 1 funding will continue to sustain the operations in all three bureaus within the Guam Police Department. It will allocate funding for our CVPR stipends, purchase parts and supplies, and fund our contractual services. It is our goal in the coming year to continue in accomplishing our vision for the Guam Police Department by growing the department through recruitment of federally funded uniform employees, obtaining more federal grant awards, strengthening our police reserve program through restructure, further increasing our vehicle fleet, and improving the conditions and standards throughout the entire department, all the while staying within the bounds of our budget proposal. In the coming months, you will see more police officers in our village and communities. Through our Mandania Cops program, you will see increased collaboration between GPD and the whole of the community. You will continue to see more downed and new vehicles out on our roads, and you will see a renewed commitment from our CVPR officers who will continue to augment our full-time force. The Guam Police Department is committed to our governor's expectation to provide the best police service that we possibly can. Internally, we will continue to improve the efficient and judicious accounting for, for funding that is made available to our department. Externally, we will continue to work with our community partners and federal counterparts to take advantage of project adoption or sponsorship and funding opportunities. We are also committed to working with this committee as well as the entire 34th Guam Legislature to assist the Guam Police Department in accomplishing its goals to ultimately ensure that the needs of our island are addressed in the realm of police services. Thank you for the opportunity to present our testimony for this budget proposal. At this point, my staff and I are subject to any questions that this committee may have. Chief, I want to thank you for probably the most thorough, thorough testimony on your, on your budget that's been presented by um, any department. Um, Sir, that's, that's through the efforts of everybody you see here at the table. And, and uh, your, whoever your MIS person probably did the best um, PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> yes. Uh, running alongside this. But also, I want to thank you for addressing both option one and option two. Yes, yeah, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate that you've addressed that because that's anticipated almost all the questions that yes. I could possibly want to ask. You've, you've answered all of them, yes, sir. probably in the most polite and diplomatic way, saying that option two is impossible. Yes, sir. Uh, without saying that, without saying it, uh, yes, sir. but very being polite about the way that you said this would not happen and that would not happen. So, yes, sir. Thank you very much for providing all that information. Um, Aside from everything, probably the only thing that I can possibly ask is, uh, well, the two questions. The, the few vacant positions that you do have. Yes, sir. Were those funded or unfunded in the current budget? In the current budget, they are. But Major Kitigo, as my services bureau chief, he can better answer that question. There's only about a dozen positions that I could yes, count. Sir. Right. Were they funded um, or unfunded? The, the budget digest, um, a lot, uh, it lists seven positions that are vacant. Although we have more people that have vacated positions from the time we submitted this budget digest, uh, which is there's an accurate account in the testimony from the chief, exactly those amounts of positions that are vacated. There are seven positions that are vacant here in the FTEs overall. For are the they funded pattern. or unfunded in the current They, they the show current. some funding there, but it, and it's $176,000 worth of funding in those vacant positions of the seven, it's a total of $176,000, but it doesn't appear that it is funded, and we, but we did include that in the personnel, overall personnel costs, including overtime, and that's why you see a difference of that, and that has <laughs> been uh, discussed. The chief had a discussion with uh, BBMR about that, that okay. difference, so it Thanks. doesn't look like it's funded, but we counted it anyways because of the zero-based budgeting requirement um, to go through the entire staffing pattern and, and make sure that it's clear exactly what numbers exist and how much they all cost. Thank you very much for, for doing it that way. Then, then we can go through it and look to see yes, sir. 
about how we can assist on that. The one thing, I commend all the work that you guys are doing, yes, sir. your Mandana Task Force. The only thing that I'm concerned about is I don't want a Department of Justice complaint against us or yes, sir. with all of your new recruitment, do you have any FAS citizens that are being considered for the police department? Because I don't want, I mean, you, you've heard the criticism of all yes, the sir. police departments and the arrests that yes, sir. in the States yes, sir. about how unrepresented and even on, on Guam, I'm afraid, yeah. non-existent in. Yes, I, Mr. Speaker, um, to address what you're asking, we, we had two police officers who are from the freely associated states. One has uh, resigned over the last year, when it, several, months. several months ago. Um, so we're not, we only have one. But to answer your question directly, because the law does allow us to recruit those from the freely associated states, we open the doors to all uh, FAS um, citizens. And as we are taking a look at it now, we consider all that. And we are definitely looking at trying to increase the recruitment uh, efforts to, to bring those types of officers into the department and take it even a step further and uh, recruit more uh, women in policing because we see that as well. Throughout the policing, throughout policing as a profession, we see that there is a disparity in that and that when you consider equality and equity in, in policing, we look to try and balance that as well. So we are trying to target that. My staff is on board with those kinds of considerations. Um, but again, we're limited to those who apply and those who meet the very stringent requirements as per uh, what's in the law, Title 10. Um, so while we've had several uh, come in for interviews, um, for one reason or another, through those four uh, main criteria, they were discounted or dis, uh, disqualified as candidates. Have you worked with GCC and President Okada to at least look at the list of people that have graduated from her CJ program and, and yes. at least consider yeah, them? Okay, okay. Major, um, Major Chong will address that in a second, but to answer your question directly, yes, Mr. Speaker. Um, you and I were both at UOG's commencement ceremony this uh, back in May, and it was at that uh, it, commencement ceremony where I spoke to Dr. Okada, and I explained to her that with this uh, DOJ COPS hiring monies that we have uh, of about $1.6 million, we are looking at uh, releasing a, a, a job announcements for police officer trainees. Now, coincidentally, as all this is going along, it, it includes, uh, based on public law 32-232, which is the post administrative rules and regulations, the, include, the inclusion of a reading and writing proficiency examination. That serves, for lack of a better term, as a selective factor. And the reason why that's important, because in my discussion with Dr. Okada, this opens the door for those specifically who've gone through the Criminal Justice Academy training up at the GCC. And I've, I've asked Dr. Okada to please contact those who have graduated from those respective academies and let them know that GPD will be recruiting. We, we have 15 positions that are, that are open uh, and they will be announced shortly. As soon as that announcement is made, she's going to uh, contact those who have graduated and encourage them to apply for those positions. So to answer your question directly, uh, Mr. Speaker, yes, I have been working with Dr. Okada. I've been working with Mr. Pete Roberto from the um, Criminal Justice Department and, and there's an ongoing cycle right now with an expect, expected graduation date of sometime in August. And again, we're encouraging those uh, candidates to apply as well. Um, so, so that's the, the direct answer. I know Major Chong wants to provide a comment. Uh, yes, sir. I've been doing uh, numerous uh, presentations at the University of Guam, specifically with uh, uh, Dr. Walter's classes. And uh, I have invited uh, FAS uh, students to, uh, you know, to look out for the uh, uh, job announcements and apply uh, either as, uh, police officers or any law enforcement uh, uh, agency because there is a need for FAS uh, police officers because, you know, the, the 
current FAS community population of Guam is really growing. So we need officers to, to help us help their personnel. So we're hit, we, we've had presentations at GCC, Captain Joe Carbolito uh, did uh, uh, a couple of presentations there. I've done numerous presentations at the University of Guam and I always bring it up uh, as part of my presentations, you know, uh, we, need, uh, we need personnel from the FAS uh, community to uh, apply for any law enforcement uh, position. Okay. That, that's very good to hear because we can control what appropriations we have from here. Yes, sir. But we have no control about what happens when the Department of Justice comes in yes, sir. in the event that there's something else. I, yes, sir. And that part I fear the most. I, yes, sir. Your, your efforts to have women in, on the force, I note that in your recent cycle, it was a woman who was the top graduate, or was it a G GCC? I, 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 saw, that, I believe that was GCC. Mr. Yeah, Speaker, I, I yes. saw that a woman yes. with the top. Yes. And so yeah. they're there. And yes. so yes. that's why I'm, I'm hoping you reach out to them. Absolutely. And, and so um, a lot of. The other departments have been complaining that they can't fill their vacancies because of salary. Um, what's the average salary for police, either st both starting and the mean salary uh, for police, um, for your force? Yes, sir. Major Kidd will um, be able to Yes. Compared nationally and stuff. Uh, uh, step one for a police officer trainee entering the police department is about 11 some dollars an hour. And they, they go through a course uh, for about six to eight months and upon graduation and commencement to the field, the field work, um, as a police officer trainee, six months of satisfactory performance is an automatic promotion to police officer one, which comes with uh, about a $3 raise up to about $14 an hour in a different um, letter grade and, st and, and uh, step. It, and this is, um, this is ongoing, it's an automatic promotion potential, so they, they don't have to undergo any uh, competitive measures. It's everyone who makes it if, you're, if you have satisfied uh, performance in the field, uh, and that's a performance evaluation report that goes to the chief, and then we develop the GG1s for all those POTs who remain in the, in the police department. So that's and, how much it and with the increases that have been provided to the to the uniformed officers in the government in, uh, over the last several years, how does that uh, average out as an as an average salary for police officers um, when compared nationally? Or so that I you're not getting any rating, are you? R-A-I-D as yes, opposed sir. to R-A-T. Are yes, sir. anybody raiding your forces to take because they get paid more at the airport or at the, at the port, do they? Yes, sir. Do they? Yep. Uh, I see the only challenge with respect to uh, recruitment is the strenuous uh, HR processes that are involved. And we've been working really close with DOA to try to get these the uh, people recruited. It's, I don't think it's the money. I do believe that it's the opportunities yes. to come in and um, in the recent uh, push by us with uh, the Department of Administration in, in agreement with it, uh, the next PLT announcement is coming out real soon. And um, they're gonna start uh, qualifying all applicants uh, in, in an ability to give us, a, to form an eligibility list and then certify those people to us for interviews and, and the rest of the process that the chief takes on. With, with all the research that you guys do, and I know that you do, with, especially now, um, comparatively, your salaries, how do they rate nationally? I, I was going to comment, Mr. Speaker, that with the 40% raise for law enforcement, it, it brings us into the ballpark of being, uh, although it's still uh, uh, lower than the national average, it, it brings us into that particular What ballpark. is the national average? I, I don't have that, def that, uh, that amount, but I, I can get that number. What is yours, um, your I'll, average? Do we have the average of all our police officers? The, the, the total amount? We have a breakdown, Mr. Speaker, a detailed one. Um, we would just need to crunch the numbers and give you that average amount, okay. starting with the, the highest paid police officer 
down to the, the lowest police. Okay, lowest no, I was rate. just wondering what the mean salary was yes, or the yes. average for the police department. Um, because yesterday I had the nurses and the doctors. Oh, I see. And so I just thought yes. I'd follow that up today. But, but thank you very much for, uh, again, a very, very thorough and even preempting my questions about HVAC at the. Yes, sir. Save yourself the questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank Your you. Your oversight chair and then the vice yes, speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning, Chief, and the rest of the force. Good morning, ma'am. I want to uh, commend you on, on the presentation you gave this morning and also the hard work that your staff has been doing to continue receiving grant funding and executing it thus far. Um, I, I have some minor questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, your presentation actually answered many of the questions that we did have. The um, the one question that, uh, that has been ringing in my mind um, was the vacant funded positions. Yes. Uh, just within the past year, you hired, sorry, c correction, you promoted 124 members of its force, uh, of your force, according to the um, the Guam Daily Post, 40 officers were promoted to the rank of police officer three, 40 were promoted to the rank of police officer two, and 34 were promoted to the rank of sergeant, and 10 were promoted to the rank of lieutenant. Um, are these numbers accurate? That those, those are accurate, yes. Okay. And was any of this money for the promotions used that was appropriated in the budget, was this used for, um, in lieu of the anticipated recruits? The anticipated what again, ma'am? I'm sorry. Your anticipated recruits, because you are allocated in accordance with the law. No, they were not. Okay. That money came specifically from the public safety vacancy pool that existed at one point. Okay. Um, and um, it's, it, it was used for that. That money uh, came to an end on September 30th of 2017. That's when that money expired, which is why we um, did the promotions. And again, that, that came to fruition for us through the public law 33163. Mm -hmm. So the, the promotions of the, that you had just mentioned were not, n no monies in our recruitment efforts were used towards the promotion. They were specifically used uh, in accordance with that, that public law 163. Okay. Just uh, for, go ahead. excuse me. That vacancy pool was created for recruiting new officers. Yes. Not, not sergeants and majors, but new recruiting new police POTs. That is correct. A and the public law, 33163, as I understand that public law, allowed us to be able to use uh, the monies from, that public, from the public safety vacancy pool. Based, based on, on how the law was written, that law allowed us to take uh, over $700,000 of that money, uh, which initially was a portion uh, to the amount of about $1.8 million, seven, over $700,000 of that through the public law allowed us to conduct the, the promotions, which mm -hmm. is, again, separate and apart from any of the monies that we have set aside for our recruitment efforts. I see. So it was a matter of the way the law was written. Um, your police reserve officers, yes. have you been able to pay them on time? Absolutely. Okay. And can you tell me a little bit about um, the police services fund? Yes, ma'am. Can you just tell me the, the, um, the authority and what it is supposed to, what it is supposed to fund? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Good morning, Senator. Good morning. Uh, the Police Services Fund, um, in, in our enabling legislation, there's a section that allows for the chief to assess fees to the public for the recovery of administrative costs only and not to be used for police operations, which is a part of the same enabling legislation in Title 10, Chapter 77. So um, we, as the chief has testified in the presentation, 
there are about 54,000 dollar I mean 54,000 transactions that occur at the rec records and ID section as well as our boating office <laughs> located in Sinahanya and of those transactions an average of about 1 million two or 1 million 300,000 is collected every year and that is um, by by this legislative body is is approved for reallocations for the following fiscal year. Now, the the expenditure of those funds, as outlined in every budget digest and approved by the by, by this body, is only for the recovery of, of administrative costs, and it never intermingles with those. Um, with, most especially with salaries for police law enforcement personnel, and it's for we use it for the rent at ITC. That's in this option one mm -hmm. uh, request right now, is to use 200 some thousand dollars throughout the year to pay for the rental service or rental uh, agreement that we have at Records and ID section at the ITC building. It's also going to fund uh, three personnel that work at Records and ID section, their salaries, with the inclusion of uh, uh, two more vacancies we're asking for, uh, data control clerks, two more uh, vacancies. Uh, it's, it's requested to fund that as well. Uh, also, um, some materials that, are, 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 that need to be bought, uh, supplies and materials, and I don't remember the details, but it is in the digest, ma'am. Okay. So that's, what, that's what the funding is used for. And can you tell me a little bit about your police patrol vehicle and equipment fund? Yes, the police patrol and equi equipment and vehicle fund uh, having not been increased by, by a bill that was put forward uh, a few months ago, uh, still remains the same. We still get uh, uh, three. Three, three, three dollars out of every, um, out of every uh, vehicle that's, that's inspected. Fifteen. And it goes into the police patrol vehicle and equipment revolving fund. And we use that. Um, there was a law that changed uh, a, a proportionate amounts that should, should have been 70, 30 percent split on, on new vehicles and equipment, it is now at the discretion of the chief, the entire fund, to use for either uh, repairs and, and, and uh, uh, supplies or, you know, to purchase uh, brand new vehicles. So just to be clear, the police services fund specifically goes to the records and IT personnel, uh, rent and supplies and materials, no? And, but right. it doesn't administrative go supplies and equipment. administrative yes. supplies, but it doesn't go to fund the force. No, it, it, no. not, not title, the salaries title, of our officers. It cannot, ma'am. Title Ten, Chapter Seventy Seven is very clear; doesn't allow us to use that kind of money. Okay. And how much money do you, um, within the past year, how much money have you spent for new vehicles and equipment? Go ahead, Henry. And what would you like to spend? in the future i mean i because some some agencies are changing out their fleets because they're expired the vehicles are expired so well at this point in time we've been afforded the opportunity to use doi monies to purchase some patrol vehicles and that one is in a current bidding process at gsa we anticipate of get getting 12 new vehicles off of that in addition to that the constant use of ovas itself uh, that is appropriate to us we use constantly for repairs, replacement of parts, uh, tires, anything mm -hmm. that deals with the maintenance. Yeah, the maintenance of a patrol vehicle as it stands, as minute as the cages in the vehicles, uh, to the tough books that have to go in it, uh, the mountings that have to do that. Anything associated with fleet is spent using all this money. And how about the technology within the, ve the vehicles? I'm sorry, one more time, the, Senator. The technology within the vehicles, like yes. your... Uh, so, so as um, Ms. Cruz was, uh, was uh, indicating, because of our um, Aegis upgrade, mm -hmm. we expect to, uh, to purchase the hardware to be put into the patrol vehicle so that every patrol cruiser made available to every patrol officer, mm -hmm. they will have that tough book in there that, that um, automates everything and accesses all the different databases to increase their efficiency out in the field. Okay. How much for the Aegis upgrade? Does this come out of the Police Patrol Vehicle and Equipment Fund? It, it does not. The Aegis upgrade is part of the general, fund, the general fund appropriations. General fund? Yes. And, and some federal funding. 
But you can use it. You can use the police patrol vehicle and equipment fund to purchase this. For the Aegis upgrade? Yes. At this point in time, uh, the way the law is written regarding that fund, mm -hmm. it can only be used for the purchase of a vehicle mm -hmm. or uh, the purchase of, of supplies, maintenance, and repairs of specifically marked vehicles. They have to be marked patrol vehicles. Okay. And how much did this cost, this Aegis upgrade? Man, the Aegis upgrade was um, about $500,000 of federally uh, federal funds. It will, we are subgrantees of the law enforcement, uh, law or records management system are managed by and administered by the Bureau of Statistics and Plans. Mm -hmm. And over the last two years, uh, monies were um, uh, used from federal funds to uh, procure approximately $500,000, a little more or less, to uh, get tighter technologies mm -hmm. over to Guam. Mm -hmm. And they're currently working on our system and we're, we're due to go live next week on Monday. So uh, this has been happening over the, the last year, since April of last year was when they received the, 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 the procurement or the purchase order and, and the contract that allowed for them to, to work with us to get this going and get it live. And it's, it's a pretty powerful tool that we expect our patrolmen mainly that are gonna be used, using <laughs> to understand everything going on on the island. They can see uh, dispatch services that are required across the island on a screen. And uh, it lessens a lot of communication back and forth with dispatchers. Just makes things a lot safer for our cops, as well as uh, information of uh, possibly guns that are registered to owners of a home, you know, an address. And we're working real close with, uh, with OTEC, the Office of Technology, to get um, some stuff that may be uh, behind, such as mapping and things like that. So that, was, that is $500,000 worth of money. We are currently spending, we currently spent, I believe, about $100,000 for uh, some laptop computers, of general fund money for laptop computers, also uh, the software, some software that was missing um, that we needed. We also, for the, for the brackets that go on the vehicles mm -hmm. to, to yes, mount the tough boats, yeah. and um, some other things like the scanners for evidence so that we can um, come to an, uh, an efficient level of operations with evidence. Because as you know, evidence can, just, can be just about anything. And, and uh, there's no real way to, uh, to categorize that and inventory those types of things. It's a very difficult job. So we want to automate that system. Okay. Um, we currently now register firearms in one location. They no longer have to run around. So we've been working hard to get them uh, computers over at the armory as well and in place, put in place a point of sales and train people to use it so that the, the customers are not running back and forth to try to get things done as well. So um, that's pretty much the, um, the overall picture that uh, we're trying to, uh, um, you know, take care of and meet those objectives for, for our police officers and for for the community seeking that service for, okay. from us. Thank you, Cap. Do you have any challenges executing monies that is coming in for the police services fund and police patrol vehicle and equipment fund? We are, go ahead, Amory, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, there are no different challenges that any other agency has in, in the sense of trying to expend it, but we do do our best to spend diligently and efficiently all the funding that we do receive, whether it's general fund, uh, special fund, or federal funding uh, monies that we receive. So let me push my question a little further. No, um, are you, are you, is every dollar um, from the police services fund and the police patrol vehicle and equipment fund put to use for its specific purpose? Yes. yes. Okay. Absolutely. Was there any monies uh, within the fiscal year 2018, 2017, and 2016 permanently transferred into the general fund from the police services fund and police patrol vehicle and equipment? There, there was not. Whatever monies were apportioned, uh, as far as we know, the monies were, whatever monies came in for the police patrol vehicle uh, and equipment evolving fund, as well as the PSF, they remained in those accounts. Um, Permanent transfer into the general fund. There were monies that were transferred from special funds 
into the general fund. For what? And how much was it? Yeah, yeah. Senator, I, I don't have the document uh, that indicates uh, exactly how much was transferred, but uh, I, I did sign a document indicating that uh, monies from, from this fund is being used uh, in the general fund. Yes, and, and that's why I asked the questions, you know, of the breakdown, because if there's anything prohibiting you in the law to execute these funds that the people are paying into, and then um, you're not able to spend anything, but you're saying that your every dollar is accounted for and you do need this money, then there shouldn't be a reason that you're transferring the P police services fund or your police patrol vehicle and equipment fund back into the general fund as a permanent transfer. And if there's something that's prohibiting you to execute this, perhaps we can take a look at the law Yes, and address and, and, and um, rewrite the law so that you can use it. Um, I don't know. You, there's a risk of you going on a furlough. You, you stated some of your concerns. A $2 million impact for your fur furlough that will impact, uh, impact our officers and, and their livelihood. Yes, and so that's my concern. If we're, I mean, we need to account for every dollar, especially the during these upcom upcoming yes, times and we don't know what's really in store for us in, within the next couple of yes, months. Yes, and so um, I would like to request that you provide yes. the um, amounts that you moved yes. from the police services fund and police patrol vehicle and equipment fund since your time as the police chief. Yes, um, and I believe that is, that's all because uh, and what, they, what was it used for? Why did you do it? You know, like what was, what was, um, we don't move money unless we're told for a reason, you need to put this money here because we're gonna use it for this. I mean, I don't think you would, you don't seem the type to arbitrarily do something like that without a concrete reason, Chief. It, it was under the direction of the Bureau of Budget and Management Research um, that this monies were to be transferred um, and the document was uh, given to me to uh, execute this transfer. Um, I, I cannot speak on behalf of, uh, of the director or the acting director with regards to that, uh, so I don't know specifically what the monies were used for when that transfer took effect. You didn't ask them why? I'm sorry? You didn't ask them why they were directing you to move money out of our public safety agency into the general fund? You didn't ask them why? I did not ask why. Okay, thank you, Chief. You're thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning, Chief, and, and all of your team and all of the officers present. I want to thank you, first of all, for your, for your service and um, uh, many of your successes have been in the news recently so, and, and throughout the year, so I want to thank you for that. And I, I think uh, especially your investigation sec section and all of you that are out there. Um, I, I, I just have a couple of questions. I, I recognize that your budget is is asking for similar level to what was you are currently operating under. Yes, ma'am. And so um, thank you for that. And yeah, I thought your presentation was very good to explain what any additional changes might, uh, what the impacts of those changes might be. Yes, ma'am. So, um, you concluded your testimony by saying that um, we are going to see more police officers in our villages and communities through the Mandania Cops program. Is this because of the 15 new officers or is this because you are going to reorganize somehow? It's, it's, be, it's a combination of both, ma'am. It's because of the 15 new officers that we, we are, are looking to recruit as well as uh, the initiatives that we've implemented under our community area policing strategy, it gets, uh, th there is a bigger focus in not just reacting to the crime that has happens out there. So through our community resource unit officers, we are seeing that there are, there's more interaction in the community. So the community can expect that, that they're gonna see more police officers out there reaching out to them. So it's a combination of the both. Changing what's happening in the department, more away from traditional policing, engaging with the community more, plus the hiring of more police officers. All right, and then it says that we will see 
more downed and new vehicles out on the roads. That's correct. Um, all right, so I guess I just want to ask you in general. So most of the staffing pattern looks like it's uh, going to remain status quo, except I thought, yeah, and, and you, you pointed out your vacancies. But does filling a vacancy, for example, in the administration division, and here you say you have six vacant positions, mm -hmm. one of them is for a police captain as a division chief, mm -hmm. is that going to remove officers from the community or the traffic um, section or the investigation divisions that, uh, is that where they currently are? No, that, that specific position was vacated by a captain that retired. And that captain was the division chief. He was in charge of the administrative services division. Um, so it is, it, while that captain could go out into the field and could be seen out in the community, um, primarily his function is to oversee the operations in administration division. Right, that's why I'm asking. So when you fill it with yes. someone else who's currently in a different position, yes. what, what happens over there? So, so that we expect to see more efficiency because we have that position filled right now that position is being filled by someone else who is who has two other responsibilities in the department so that that uh lieutenant that's that's filling that position now has to um spend less of his time focusing on those tasks that he's been assigned to because he also has to oversee the administration of that division so if we get that captain position filled it better, it increases our efficiency and our ability to provide better service in the administration's division because that lieutenant that's filling it is in that division as well. So it's not like it's being filled by a position from somebody who would be out in the field per se. Uh, it's being filled by somebody that's already in the administration's division filling the gap. Uh, for and how, how do you intend to fill it after the new budget is approved? Or, or you can fill this right now? We, we, if we get the monies that we need, we mm -hmm. can submit a GG1 for an announcement, All right. and then uh, officers within the force would apply for the position. All right. Okay. I understand. I, 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 I'm just curious, when you fill the positions that you specified here, not all of them are in you know, the community in the, or in the precincts or in, out in traffic. Right. And so right. is that going to result in a decrease in those areas, in investigation, traffic, or the precincts? We, we don't anticipate that. Again, with the 15 new uh, police officer trainees that are coming in, the, the should, if those positions get filled by police officers who are moving up uh, in, in the rank, the, the newer police officers coming in will fill the lower, uh, the lower echelon. All right, I understand. I guess for me, a layperson, though, you know, I, I like to see the experienced officers are the yes. ones that are actually out there in our community yes. while, while, you know, we are facing this type of crime. Right. But uh, I'm going to respect your judgment on those things, but yes. uh, I just hope that that's something that you continue to think about. Yes, ma'am. When, when um, Highway Patrol Division, you, you said it, um, there are no vacancies there, but when I compared it to 2018, it looks like there's a reduction of FTEs. Is that correct? Uh, Madam Vice Speaker, there is a spreadsheet that identifies general fund funding for about 20 positions. Um, there is also another spreadsheet in the staffing pattern for special funds the tourist attraction fund that identifies about 30 some positions for the same precinct. Okay. So the general fund funding is, is actually funding under Tumuni precinct staffing. Um, no, I'm looking at the highway patrol division. Right. There are other. Oh, you're saying some the, of yeah. those were transferred into Tumon precinct? Yes. Okay. To, to make use of the general funds that were allocated to Tumuni precinct. Um, they've lumped in All officers right. from different areas such as um, four officers that are actually under the Tamuning Precinct general fund uh, category of the staffing pattern. They're actually, they actually belong at HPD, but HPD is only funding that, that whole staffing pattern for HPD. If you notice, that's highway funds, mm -hmm. but the highway funds were exhausted. If you give us that money, it exhausts at 16 when there's actually more in another, uh, they, they exist under general funds in a separate spreadsheet. 
So those guys belong there. Right. And, and to follow up with the question with the chief about administration division, there are eight police officer trainees right now that are funded in the administration division. They start training on Monday and they would be expected to complete in, in February of next year and they will go directly to the field. So the, the, um, the positions that you see it in the administration division will, will, will spike or go down in certain times of the year depending on the amount of um, unsworn officers that are brought on the force because they can't, they can't do the work, work of field work. So they belong to, to administration division for that length of time that it takes to get them certified and for the chief to swear them in as police officers for the field. All right, thanks. And, and I was just curious because, yeah, the, yes. the staffing pattern for 18 and 19, they're almost identical except for those four. Right. And, then, and then it shows a significant reduction. So, right. Yes. all right. Um, I don't have any real more particular questions. Oh, yes, this one about the headquarters. So we see your new headquarters is uh, for, being built. For Central Precinct. When do you expect that to be done and how does that impact FY19 budget? Does that impact FY19 at all? Um, the, the precinct commander for Agania Precinct is uh, Captain Stephen Ignacio. Him and his operations chief, uh, Lieutenant Stephen Amaguin, are projecting the opening of that precinct in August. And they've been working very close with the builders. They, oh, they I'm sorry. Is that just an Agania Precinct? Only Agania Precinct, That's not the headquarters? No, ma'am. No, oh, no, so you no. will continue with your headquarters, rent, y everything? Y yes, right. we will. Yes, we will. Oh, so that is, that what is, is the impact then of that? That would be a whole brand new rent that you have to pay, or what would you have to pay there? No, what, what are that you? is not that is not under under rent because okay. it's being built for the government. Yes, it's not owned by a. So non after the construction's done, just regular utilities, that yes, type of thing. Okay, yes, excellent. Yes, if I, if I could add, yeah. uh, the chief has just agreed with a uh, private company seeking a federal grant, a federally funded grant, to uh, put solar panels on the building in order to, to draw the power down. So this individual, this uninterested, I guess, if he's a private company, I'm not too sure, has, has already gone to some of the precincts, done some site visits and got some um, energy consumption numbers uh, in the different precincts to try to, to try to get a hold of some grant, federal, grant, federal grant money to put in place some, um, some solar panels. So that working with the chief and the governor's office uh, this individual is seeking out to, to give us some assistance. He's taking an interest All in right. trying to reduce our, our utility rates there as well. So we're, we're kind of expecting something to come out of that. I see. That's great. Um, so, but this new building will not uh, help you alleviate rental from, for example, records or, or the headquarters or no. any other what, division? What it would do, uh, Madam Vice Speaker, is if you're aware, again, your precinct is now at a building that was originally constructed back in 1954. Um, a building that old probably doesn't have any reason to be standing on our island. Um, it's, it's riddled with, with all kinds of issues, which is why we, we uh, put in with Gura to build a new precinct headquarters. So we're replacing one government building with another government building, um, and it won't replace any of the rental space that we're currently occupying because it's, it's for the precinct that's in Aganya moving up to Sinanya. Is that a possibility, though, at this point? It, it's possible. We can take a look at that. But uh, we have to take a look at issues of uh, unsworn personnel in, in the uh, administrative and support divisions, taking them and putting them at a precinct headquarters, especially up in, in Sananya, because that will be the precinct that uh, our processing section is at. So there are going to be arrested persons that come through there. So there's the potential then uh, to, to put civilian employees uh, in a precinct where there's a high volume of traffic that involves criminal, ongoing criminal investigations and the handling of persons in custody. So we, we need to be, a, a, as a, a management team, we need to be mindful that if we take civilian employees who are not sworn, who, are, who do not carry the necessary equipment, should something happen at one of those headquarters, we may be putting them uh, in a particular situation. So those are things that we are keeping in the back of our mind. What about the detention facility? Is that moving also or not? It's, it's, technically speaking, it's a processing section. Um, so uh, we would process the police. Yes, to answer yes. your question, that section will move with the Ganya precinct. 
with all its uh, hardware and software uh, to be able to process persons in custody uh, to be then taken up to the Department of Corrections should they, should they need to be confined, otherwise they would be booked and released. It just seems to me that if you have an opportunity to save on some rent that yes, uh, we do that while well, yes, you've got uh, a building being built. Yes. But All right. Yeah. Um, thank you again to all of you thank for you. your service and uh, thank you for your presentations today. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. Um, just, just a couple more. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Um, how many individuals currently serve as members of your police reserves? There are 73 on the books, but uh, as far as the active um, CVPRs, mm -hmm. we only have about 25 or 30. 20. 25 to 30 active. What is it, 25 to 30, 26, 27? What is the number? Ma'am, sometimes 25 people will uh, complete their 42 hours in a month. Then the next month, it'll be a little bit more, it'll be a little bit less. So the average is between 25 and 30 because the word civil uh, volunteer is, is what keeps these people from having a consistent schedule with the Guam Police Department. Okay, but how many do you account for? I will use the number 25 if okay. you want a number. Yes, thank you, thank Major you. 25 Chong. is the number okay. of active CVPRs. Oh, I would think public safety, you have concrete numbers of your accountability even though they pull a couple hours here and there. The, um, I was looking in the budget to find the CVPR funding. Is it is it um, under a different category other than CVPR? Go ahead. Uh, it's under the miscellaneous category under miscellaneous. operations. Okay. We've um, uh, allocated, I think, $70,000 for the, yes. $53,500 for, um, for the CVPR stipends that they get. They get a uniform stipend only because they are not employees, so. Okay, um, yeah. thank you. Um, there were some concerns about um, vehicles being taken home uh, off duty. Can you just say something if that's not true or? The, the policy of the Guam Police Department is that we are authorized based on uh, our understanding of how the laws are written and our policies and procedures that for those who uh, would need to potentially respond um, you know, for, for activation, our criminal investigations division, and so on and so forth, would need to respond. Those, those officers are allowed to take vehicles home uh, strictly for that use in the event that they would need to respond. Okay. Could, you know, I'm asking this question because we're trying to see where we can trim a little bit. Yes, ma'am. And we had the same issue with our utilities agency. GPA had to restructure their whole vehicle program because yes, personnel were taking yes, vehicles home. Yep but they did save a lot in the end when they ended that practice. Right. Um, earlier in the year, we had some of the questions about jurisdictional, mm -hmm. um, and I noticed that um, in the presentation you gave an explanation for your DOC uh, transition to a system with their overtime, but you didn't mention the um, uh, augmenting of, of other um, public safety agencies such as the port police, yes. the airport police. I'd, I'd like to discuss this jurisdictional question because if we need to amend the law, as we discussed, to give you the authority to deputize mm -hmm. some of these personnel so that they can work within the realms of, of the Guam Police Department under your, you know, operational control, yes. then that's something that you need to address. We're pretending like it never happened because yes. once the question was asked, operations changed with the 24 to 48 hours. But uh, I think we need to address this yes, sooner or later because this, was, this may be an issue as yes. we address the budget. I agree. And then one last one. Uh, during the special sessions, we requested for your executive security overtime costs, mm -hmm. but to also include the travel costs and per diem. Mm -hmm. So the flights, the tickets, the, yes. the mills. Ground you know, transportation. And we haven't received that. So can we, we just? We submitted it. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll made. double check, but. That was you that turned it in, right? Yeah. We received that, the overtime, but not the, uh, the I, ticket We will cost. double check our, our records, yeah. but um, I was assured. 
Again, Not, it's, it's okay. Uh, it's my just... responsibility. Yeah. I will double check that. Uh, but I was I was pretty confident that I signed a document indicating that over time. Uh, asking for the over for the information that you asked in okay. the, those special sessions. Yeah, I don't. I'm, I'm not. Sure, I don't think we got the okay. ticket cost and the uh, ME and I, and then also um, just those two things. And by the time we end, if we can get it by next week, uh, yes, the breakdown of the PSF and the uh, police vehicle yes, and equipment fund, and then the the per diem, if we can just clarify that and then yes thank you very much for all your work yes, uh, I'd like to thank the police force for you know continually to put their lives um, in harm's way and, and willing to protect our community with without any second thoughts it takes a lot of courage to do so yes, thank you thank you chief you're welcome chief I let me just follow up on one question when your oversight chair questioned about the transfer out yes I had my staff um, check for the transfers and if the information that I received is that it came out of the police patrol vehicle and equipment revolving fund mm -hmm. it was the OVIS and I thought earlier in the discussions with your oversight chair that those funds are restricted for your use within the department for vehicles and for, and that it's not, I think you very clearly stated, it wasn't supposed to be used for operations. Was that correct? What, what's the restrictions on the use of your, your OVIS funds? Well, with OVIS particularly, the focus is all of the marked patrol vehicles and anything associated with those marked vehicles, whether it's uh, repair, standard repair, maintenance, and parts that are needed, as for monies that were transferred out, they weren't, as far as I know, they weren't transferred out into any area within uh, OVIS itself. It may have been transferred somewhere else, but I'm not privy to that information. The chief, in signing the document, I know you're a good soldier and you comply when directed. That was $166,970. $166,970 that was transferred out of the OVIS, what you guys call OVIS, it's, that is known as the P Police Patrol Vehicle and, and Equipment Revolving Fund. Yes. And it was transferred into the general fund that definitely is not anything within your department. And it concerns me when in your op between option one and option two, you talk about the possibility of not funding $102,000 in, in um, equipment purchase and the equipment purchase that might be lost would be law enforcement gear, dual ammo pouches, belt keeper, duty gear belts, handcuffs with case, flashlight with holder, mace and holster, PR baton and ring holder, tasers, replacement cartridges and portable radios. All kinds of equipment's going to be lost if you don't, if in option two. But you guys agreed, you signed a document that transferred $166,970 into the general fund. I, yes. I really, I haven't looked to see whether or not in 18 any of the funds have been transferred out. Um, I am imploring you to please not transfer. I mean, yesterday I had the director of public health and social services and pointed out two transfers. And we here in this legislature have always placed you and public health and education as our top priorities. Yes, sir. And we do so purposely because of our belief in what you can and should be doing for the community but also our concern for the public, the safety of the officers. 
And if you transfer that money out, that money could have used, been used for this equipment this last year, as opposed to waiting for it in 19. Yes, sir. And for their safety, and their safety to provide for our safety. Yes, sir. So you've got to be yes, sir. a little more diligent in seeing to it that that is not done. Yes, sir. Or at least standing up for us to, to make sure, because we try. Yes, sir. Your oversight chair, let me tell you, she, she beat me up dearly last year because I wasn't providing enough. Yes, sir. Um, she's constantly fighting for, for you guys. And to know that this funds that we give you guys the authority to collect and you guys are diligent about not using it within the department for what you believe to be inappropriate and um, illegal use within the department, that all of a sudden you allow it to be transferred into a black hole that none of you seem to understand where it went to or what for what yes, really is, I can't even describe. But anyway, yes, I'm glad she pointed it out. I, and um, I... Uh, everything that is on the legislative website uh, that um, when you send things in and I look at transfers, I um, remembered that from last year, but I just didn't recall it for this, this hearing, and I'm glad your oversight chair did. Yes, sir. And then I just it, asked my staff to remind me what that was for. But, but that was really grossly inappropriate use of OVIS funds. Okay. Yes, sir. With that, um, I will allow you to make a closing statement, and then we'll recess. Do we have any, anything to close with? Do we have to close with anything? Do you want to close with anything? Oh, wait, now, sir, the, now we, the vice speaker wants We don't have anything to close with. Chief, I've been getting calls about... Um, People who call in to police precincts and then they're told, okay, we'll be there in uh, several of the calls said over an hour. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, are the times getting longer? I know you have a matrix, but yes. uh, I never had that experience before. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. is, but it seems like now it's becoming more common. Is that something you've seen also? What, what, what uh, drives that, uh, the lengthens the amount, the response time is calls uh, in progress. So if, if somebody calls that uh, as we prioritize the number of calls that we come in, and that's a function of what the field supervisor does working with um, th the management at the precinct, if, the calls, if there are calls for service in progress, there's a robbery going on or uh, people are fighting with each other, those take precedence over uh, the, the non-emergency calls. So Oftentimes, when a citizen will call into the precinct, they may get frustrated because they had to wait an hour, a couple hours, um, because of the fact that they responded to a call in progress that resulted in the arrest of, of an individual or several individuals, and that's more downtime. So it, be, it becomes an issue, and across the precincts, they work to support each other. So that if, if there's a call up north, and there's, there's officers down south that can hand up, uh, lend a hand with that, we, we uh, take a look at that, and we have duty officers, staff duty officers uh, on duty in the evening hours uh, when, when we're done working, our, our normal workday is off, over, to be able to make those kinds of decisions uh, to apportion our force accordingly to be able to deal with that as, as best we can. All right. I just yeah, want to put that on the record because um, almost all the calls that people talk to me about are always because someone, you know, broke into their cars, yes. um, those types of at the house, at the homes yes. where they try to break into the houses or they broke into their cars. And you and I both live in Jonia and yes. I, I'm, I hope you share my concern that this, there was a um, high increase in this type of incident, like you said, around yes. December, and, but it seems to be recurring again. And uh, even my house, but not just that, it's like everyone, 
the yes. whole neighborhood. We have the same stories, and so yeah. I, I, those that actually do find something or, or call the police, they say they, they've been told to, it's going to take a while. So I don't know. I, I just want to know, uh, hopefully, I, you know, we're going to hear from your department. What are we going to do about that type of yes. this? It seems to be, you know, Facebook's very popular. They send these stories around and around, and now we've got these village uh, chats yes. where we get to talk about the incidences, yes. and they really do seem to be increasing to us. Does it look like that to you? Well, I will tell you, uh, Madam Vice Speaker, that there was an incident that occurred, and, and since you're uh, referencing um, the village of Jonia, uh, there were certain individuals that were running around in the village. Through the efforts of our Criminal Investigations Division, we were able to identify who these individuals were uh, through uh, intelligence that, w that was gathered, through good patrol work out in the field. We identified that and um, we targeted uh, these particular individuals who we believe were causing those kinds of crimes. So you would see a spike when, when there are certain individuals that are out there uh, committing crimes in our community and that's when those robbery task forces um, come into play to be able to, to deal with that so that it takes the pressure off of the patrol officers that are out in the field trying to, to handle those kinds of um, first response um, at the patrol level. So um, that's what we were seeing in that particular area. And there were, when we mentioned the robberies, especially this recent rash of robberies where it started to become violent, um, again, within a matter of 24 to 48 hours in working with um, you know, gathering the, the appropriate intelligence, we already identified or we had, a, I, we had an idea of who the individual or individuals were. And then we, we, we built a task force, they, they uh, conducted uh, police investigations and those individuals were subsequently brought, were arrested. So again, we deal with this as it comes and I understand the community's frustration. We go out to town hall meetings, we meet with them. Trust me when I say, uh, I would 80% to 90% of the conversation is exactly that. Chief, why does it take so long? And I only live in Aganya Heights and it's a five minute drive, but it took your officers all night to get there. So I had to explain to them that there's a dynamic that happens and we're aggressively working on that. And again, it's why we reach out to the community to make themselves less of a target. And uh, Senator Castro is, is part of a very aggressive watch program in Barragada, those are the things that, that help out. So that it's not just the police responding or reacting to crime, but it's a concerted effort between us and the community to, to deal with what you're reading on Facebook. Okay. Well, thank you. And also the mayors uh, also bring that to my attention, just so you know. Yeah, yes. they seem to be noticing an increase also. But I, want to do th I do want to thank the investigation work and yes. uh, all of you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Again, I thank you all the officers that are here and all those that are out in the precincts and on the streets for all that you do. And again, thank you for the most thorough budget presentation, including option one and two. Thank you, Mr. Uh, we are in recess until this afternoon at two o'clock when we meet with the Guam Police Department. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members of the com committee.